So we had the privilege to pray for James O'Keefe. And uh, he's, he's struggling with faith. And I love the conversations you and I have had. And when I read that, you know, defense of you and talked about how, well, he's going to be in a room full of pastors. Wouldn't you want him to be there if you want him to know the Lord kind of thing? And, and as I went through this, I, I love your honesty in relation to where you are. You're, you're very much in that sense like James O'Keefe. And, and his was, I'm, I'm taking on a spiritual battle because I'm contending for truth. And he's seen evil, and so have you. And there's the opposite of that. Has the church had a role in opening your eyes to that spiritual battle? And then the reverse question would be, what can the church do better to inspire folks like you and James to know him from your estimation? Well, that's an interesting question. It is definitely the case that what is happening in the big picture is a spiritual battle, whatever the word spiritual means. Uh, this is without question. In fact, I texted Charlie the other day, um, and I texted, I said, Charlie, I think that communism is by far the best evidence out there for the existence of Satan. And Charlie texted back just this, if Satan, then God. And I was like, okay, Charlie. <laughs> okay. All right, the, the second part of the question. Well, there's a lot to this question. This is a spiritual battle. You, you did ask it as the church played a role in it, opening my eyes to the, to the nature of the spiritual battle. I, I, I think that it is more accurate to say that my interaction with Christians, with Church with the Pastors Conference, with, with you and, and Charlie and, and, and the whole TPUSA faith and so on, and other churches have had me to speak, believe it or not, after you. You were first. You were first. Everybody let it be known. He was first. Uh, I think it's given me a vocabulary uh, more than anything else. I'm currently working on a book. Uh, big surprise for me that I'm working on a book. I'm working on a book about principles and tactics for engaging in leftist political warfare. How do we understand this? How do we deal with it? How do we counter it? And I just kind of keep I keep stumbling on the fact that some enterprising Christian is going to realize that everything that I can write can be regrounded back into the scripture extremely. It's all so biblical. You know, it's like love the truth, you know, with all your mind and all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Uh, you know, always do the right thing, especially when it's costly. Like, I think the entire Old Testament is a story about that. Um, it's really profound that I think that that... That this it does it equips me with a vocabulary though to be able to see this and so it's it's been very helpful. What can the church do better? Well, it's this is a difficult thing to say because the church is too broad of an umbrella to articulate really simply. Because a lot of you guys, those those represented in the room. Well, that, now you've made it even harder because the people that are the problem I don't think are here. <laughs> I can tell you a lot of examples of things not to do. Uh, you're welcome to go look at my Twitter feed right now where I'm being very sarcastic about that at the in present. And a lot of people are not catching on to the joke. Um, I, I'm, I'm adopting the mantle of the godless atheist that I get accused of being all the time. Oh, this godless atheist is going to teach people. <sighs> Please, I just want to tell you about the communists so we can stop them. I don't. I don't need this static. So that's actually a thing that the, I don't think that I've ever, I've ever felt it from anybody at any of the pastor's summits that I've been to. I don't think I've ever ran into it at a turning point or turning point faith event. So the people in the room are to be exempted from this criticism. But this kind of like really intense presuppositionalist, like you can't possibly know anything or have morals if you can't ground it in God. That annoys people like me a lot, and whether it's for right or for wrong, it does not bring us closer. It drives us away. It drives us away vigorously, and it's a crying shame. Um, I would say, again, nothing about the people in this room, but what I've witnessed spending a lot of time in Christian spaces. I don't know if you've noticed that Christians are very frequently gossipy folk, and they're they can get a little political and it gets a little uh, cutthroat in the politics. As an outsider watching people play power politics in the name of Christ, it's really not appealing. Um, it, it's really, really unappealing to watch Christians backstab each other and, and, and cheat each other 
So don't do that. Don't don't do that. It's really ugly. It's it, it just doesn't doesn't help your case. Um, what has worked is cultivating a genuine relationship, spending time having real conversations about whether they're spiritual matters or life matters or whatever else, and letting the witness shine through. And not even it doesn't the witness doesn't even have to lead. But just letting it shine through is actually very appealing. It makes me more curious. It makes me want to go read the word more and, and get more familiar with it to see where this is coming from. Did, so, did you just say the word? I said the word. I love that. Come on. He's, he's I, cap- cap- <laughs> I said it, but you couldn't hear that I capitalized the W-2. Do you get it? You did it. In my mind. Yeah. All it, right. Linguistics. I, I, that was that was a twisted question, and you made sense of it, and I'm grateful. Um, I don't know why they put me here because I'm not good at this. Yeah, well, but I have to I have to tell you, it's all right. It's all right. I, I, you're you're not as bad as Eric Metaxas. Yeah. He's he's yeah. Every I time heard I'm he's your him, dad. Is that true? I got here late last night. Yeah, yeah. Or no, you're his dad. He's Charlie's dad, right? Is that how that works? I don't know. I flew in late, and all kinds of mysteries have been occurring since I got here. Uh, I haven't worked to the bottom of, thanks to Mr. Metaxas's wit. Yeah, yeah, and lies. So I was, I wanted to get to the place where you were instrumental in opening my eyes to critical race theory. I ran with that, read your book, but, you know, reading through that, you had already written two others in the time I had read through that, and that was a big work that I undertook. Now we're dealing with, you're, you jumped in and, and you have really been exposing or at least defining communism in ways we've never seen. Can you take the time to do that now? Because I don't think we can ever hear this enough. Yeah, so one of my primary theses, the theses, 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 that I'm forwarding that is upsetting some people, especially in the uh, not at all corrupt academia, is that we've misinterpreted communism from the beginning. From from you go all the way back to Karl Marx, or even the Communist League preceding him, and we talk about, especially Marx, though, uh, the idea that this is just a political system or an economic system or a social system or the combination thereof misses the point entirely. And this is why we say this is a a spiritual battle. It is a theology, a very inverted, upside down, if you actually, I said to Charlie, it's the best evidence of Satan, satanic theology. Uh, And if you don't understand it that way, if you argue about the economics or if you argue about the social system or you argue about uh, the political aspects of it, then what you do is you miss its essence. And by missing what it really is, you can't solve it. So I actually think getting this wrong, not recognizing communism and Marxism specifically as an approach to communism, as a theological doctrine uh, prevents us, and it has been the most costly mistake possibly in human history. We're talking hundred maybe 200 million people, not just dead, but murdered or starved because we didn't get this question right as to what was Marx really driving at. And what Marx was really driving at was an answer to the, to the very deep, very fundamental question of what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to exist in this world, and what do we do with that? Those are fundamentally religious questions. What does it mean to be a man? And if we go back to his uh, first major published work, which is his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, which he wrote in 1843. The manifesto was 1848, so you have some sense of the dates. Capital was 1867, so that's much later. So this is very early in Marx's career. He's maybe 24 years old. He writes this critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. You've heard of this work, even if you don't know that you've heard of this work, because the first page of this work contains the infamous statement that religion is the opiate of the masses. And so what he actually articulates a couple of paragraphs down, he doesn't just say at the the first paragraph asserts that all true criticism begins with a criticism of religion. Another paragraph or two down, he says the opiate of the masses. 
He says that, what does that mean, by the way? It means that what religion does is it dulls your senses to the suffering that you have in the world. And the suffering could awaken you to the true nature of life, the true nature of what it means to be human. And what he says a couple paragraphs further down from that is that he says that what religion does is it erects itself as a false sun and mankind revolves around the false sun of religion instead of doing what he should, which is to erect himself as his own true sun to revolve around himself. In case you wondered if it's a satanic theology. It is that we are not just as gods, but we are our own god. A year later, he's writing this thing called, it's, it summarizes the economic and philosophic manuscripts. Sometimes it's called the Paris Manuscripts. Sometimes it's just called the Manuscripts of 1844. And he's explaining in this that, in fact, he's trying to do like the infinite regression thing. He says, well, where did man come from? Well, man came from his parents. Well, where did, he, where did his parents come from? Well, from their parents. Well, if you keep, keep going back and back and back and back, where do they come from? And he actually says, don't ask me. You're going into the abstract. You're missing the point. The point is that man came from man. Man was his own creator. Man is the product of the history of man. So now there's this concept, this force called history. And history moves, but where does history come from? History is the history of man's activities. So history comes from man, but history is what makes man. And so the entire process is this circular process. And what can we do with this? We can seize the means of production. We can seize the means of production of society. We can seize the means of production of economics. We can seize the means of production of cultural property or social property like race or sex or gender or sexuality. And we can use that to direct man to his intended uh, state of being. And where do we find that? By going all the way back to understand what man was in the first place before what you might articulate as the fall of man. Now, of course, Christianity articulates a fall of man, and we all know what that's about in this room. Marxism posits that with the introduction of the division of labor and the introduction of the concept of private property, man alienated himself from his true self. He alienated himself from who he really is, so he can't see it anymore. He alienated himself from each other. And what it does is it actually brings individuality into the world, that you are a unique individual character. Why? Because if I can own this... It's mine, it's not yours, so I can distinguish you from me. It's that simple. So the second I say there can be private property, and thus there can be a division of labor about how I'm going to organize the production of private property, man has fallen from his true nature, which he can come to know as a saving knowledge, which is that he's actually social, perfectly social. He is a man who lives for other men. He is a man who lives for the entire species. He called it a species being. Man is in his essence a species being, a being that lives for the entire species. And what is he actually saying here? He says, well, there's a secret knowledge that's higher than the knowledge of religion. And that secret knowledge is that man is already completely self-sufficient. He is actually self-sufficient in his perfect social nature. And the only reason he doesn't know that he's a perfect socialist is because there's private property teaching him that he gets to be an individual, that he gets to separate himself from you and you and you and you. But if we were to remember that, if we were to remember who we really were and recollect as a total socialist collective, then we could save ourselves and we could direct ourselves as our own son that we revolve around in our own self-worship. This is a religion. It is a very twisted religion. It is a religion based on a... Uh, esoteric, mystical misinterpretation of Christianity done by his predecessor Hegel, then turned upside down, in other words, inverted or made satanic by Marx. So every Christian virtue gets turned into a vice, every Christian vice gets turned into a virtue. And if you actually look around the world and see how these people have acted, whether it's in history in Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, Vietnam, Cuba, Venezuela, you go, you, you pick your favorite communist country. I know you don't have a favorite. Canada. <laughs> Canada. C California. What you see is, and in fact, California is a great example with these laws that have just recently been being passed. You see an inversion. You see an elevation of what do we celebrate for like two to seven months in the summer now? Pride. You see an elevation of the vices. And you see, what's the body positivity movement? 
is that a celebration of sloth and gluttony or is it something else? I'm just saying, you see every vice elevated and every virtue torn down. What you see in the fancy pants language of the philosophers is a perfectly antinomian movement. In other words, not just rejecting the law, nomian refers to law, nomos, not just rejecting the law, but in, or not just ignoring the law, but intensely doing the opposite of whatever the order of the structure of the universe happens to be. It is inverting the truth with lies. It is replacing the truth with lies and creating social circumstances in which we all feel compelled to go along, to get along, or else we're not exhibiting that we're the perfectly social being that we were originally supposed to be, that we prove that we are by, I guess, going to work and earning money so that we can pay Karl Marx's bills. My brain is full. I have stretch marks on my brain. Thank you very much, Dr. Lindsay. I want to also ask you, and, and leave me about 45 seconds at the end, and we'll finish on time, but I want, to, I want you to address the transgender and how significant this movement is and what is it's being thrust upon us um, as it plays into all of this. I mean, there's a billion ways to, to, to do that, but it's kind of the most direct way to see that it's esoteric evil religion being practiced, uh, largely by people who don't even know that they're practicing it. But you guys will remember the controversy with Target, I'm sure, where they had this designer that was doing these very satanic and ugly and awful things, and a lot of it was like pro-transition. A lot of people don't realize that one of his designs that he actually had was this skeleton, all pink and blue and smokes and things with a cauldron, stirring the magic pot, and it says in the words, it says, transition is alchemy. Those are the words on the poster that he made. Transition is alchemy. Of course, he had other things that were explicitly satanic and so on. So what do you have here? You have this belief system that society, for those of you who know the fancy words of the Gnostics, that society works like a demiurge. It tells you who you have to be. Oh, you were born in a body that a doctor came along and assigned as male or female or whatever, we'll say male. You were born in a body, a doctor assigned as male, and then all of the people around you, your parents, your neighbors, your relations, the people at the school, everybody affirmed, oh, look at the little boy. Treat him like a little boy. Raise him as a little boy. Raise him to be a man. And the social circumstances forced you to live your body a particular way. But maybe you didn't feel that way inside. Maybe there's a secret knowledge of yourself that can save you from the demiurgic power that society is impressing on you. Now, what Michel Foucault actually said, and this was a thing I had to mull over for a long time, Michel Foucault being the postmodern demonic philosopher, uh, French philosopher, he said, and he's the father of queer theory where all this comes out, he said, it's not so much, I really had to puzzle over this, Rob. It's not so much that the body imprisons the soul as it is that the soul imprisons the body. And what he was talking about is the idea that people in society tell you who you have to be based on configurations of your body. That's why the trans people say, you're so obsessed with genitals, as if genitals determine who you have to be. So now you have to live your life in a way that maybe you don't feel. So now you can tap into a secret knowledge that maybe the doctor got it wrong. The doctor didn't know who I really am inside. My soul might actually be female, but I was assigned male at birth and reaffirmed that. And I can undergo all of this radical activism, including transforming my own body and mutilating my own body, which is a hermetic right, is to leave the body behind, destroy the fallen material form. I can do this in order to liberate my soul by putting society in a position where it has to affirm me rather than deny how I feel. In other words, we can transform the social circumstance, which is their equivalent of the Holy Spirit. We can transform that to an affirming one rather than a denying one and an oppressive one. And that's how this religion works. It is the most visible and the most visceral and the most literal in the trans movement. And what you are watching play out with these poor kids who are being socially transitioned, groomed through media, groomed through doctors, groomed through psychologists, groomed through teachers, groomed through Senator Scott Weiner. What you're seeing, California, what you're seeing, I shouldn't say him specifically, his policies that he relentlessly puts through the California legislature, what you are seeing is 
a religious right that is sacrificing their bodies in the pursuit of this evil religion. And that gets about as disgusting as it can get. And that's at the bottom why this is not just a physical war or a medical war or a psychological war, but a spiritual war for the spirits and lives of our children. All right, uh, that was that was awesome. Um, I've got a minute left. Thank you for being gracious. You gave me 15 more seconds. I'm grateful for that. I want to say this. Um, what are you doing uh, February 13th to the 22nd? I don't know. If, if, if I paid for you to go to Israel, would you come with us on our turning point trip? I would be very warm to that idea, yeah. How about that? All right. You're in. Check your calendar. Now we're adding you. We've got Sean Foyt. We've got Victor Marks. We've got Congressman Bob McEwen. We've got Frank Ramsewer from uh, uh, t- Tennessee and Pastor. This is going to be a great trip, and I want to put it up on the screen real quick. Show it if you would. Uh, anyone? Hello. Anyone back there? Just switch that slide over if you would. It's on there. Good. I'm a little out of it. Uh, so Even in the future, nothing works, yeah, Rob. Scan that QR code and... All of you are invited. You have to pay your way. I'm paying for his. Come on out. It'll be incredible. They'll all be speaking. And the only requirement is you have to share one night, if you would, or two. I, I can probably do that. There we go. No better place than to put him under pressure in front of all of you. All right. Well, let's thank our dear friend, Dr. James Lindsay.